What do you make of your Russian colleagues here? I'm fascinated by what he's doing, and I'm intrigued by his ability to get out what he is doing into the into the West, because the state of sort of a position in Russia is not what we have come to respect in the West. You're yeah. talking about Yevgeny Kerpinski. Yes. Mm -hmm. you know, I imagine you don't mm -hmm. view ketamine with... Well, how do you view ketamine? It's a... Um, it's an anesthetic, and it's a dissociative thing. And it puts me out of body. It's very dissociative. It puts me out of mind. It just you're away, and I, frankly, with a full bladder, like being here. And uh, you suddenly realize that someone has a full bladder, and at only one intellectual level you realize it's you. <laughs> yes. No, I, it's so seriously disassociated mm -hmm. me that I felt it was a great victory when I finally realized mm -hmm. that this was a drug. Mm -hmm. For a long time, I couldn't figure out what it was or who was even asking the question. They kept calling it vitamin K, which is a fascinating euphemism for allowing to have some semblance of a food additive for a dietary supplement. But well, I, I, I had the interesting pleasure of being back at a big company in the East uh, the day they had bought the rights to distribute ketamine. And I informed them, you do realize that ketamine is being made by Park Davis and shipped off to... Uh, Mexico is imported in gallon, but not gallon, but liter bottles, all with a percentage of preservative, and comes right back into California in the trunk of the car. Oh, about 20 years, years ago, there was a uh, class of compounds called quinucleidines, and for about three or four years, I just noticed that there was no publishing in the Russian literature whatsoever on the area of quinucleidines. Then all of a sudden, the Russian literature started publishing, and then we went into a sort of a gap. And then quinucleidine benzoate, which is one of the most potent of the anticholinergics, was suddenly revealed that the Russians were working on it as a chemical warfare agent, and then we were working on it as a defense against their chemical warfare agent. Uh-huh. And it's actually, it's actually 10, 20 micrograms. 10, 20 micrograms. Yeah. It makes you really wonky. It's like atropine. Delusion, confusion. Uh-huh. But they design these fantastic bombs that they can explode and send out millions of little hypodermic hits. And so they don't have to worry about wind blowing it down wind or upwind. So it's essentially a chemical cluster bomb. Cluster bomb, some but sort. little hypodermic needles. Yeah, I'm telling you. <laughs> so that's probably in the inventory. It's already in the inventory. Uh-huh. Well, I someone mentioned to me that you had expressed interest now that you felt you had sort of done the work you wanted to do with cyclicized phenylethylamines mm -hmm. and that you were going back to looking at tryptamines. Very much so. That's the other side of the coin. It's as rich and unexplored in areas that phenylethylamines were 20 years ago. So are you going to illuminate it for oh, us? Absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> I've already made the T-butyl, T-butyl methyl, isopropyl methyl is well known, but the secondary butyl methyl is not known. They're all active by smoking. Uh-huh. And what are they, could you, in a blind test, pick one out from another, or are they sort of... I don't know yet. I don't know yet. I doubt it somehow. I think they're all going to be fast, impactful, and all very much like DMT. Duration-wise, or Duration -wise, presentation -wise. Uh, Probably, some, uh, perhaps a little bit more potent. A little bit more yeah, potent. DMT is not that, that all-fired potent. It takes, you know... 10, 20, 50, no more, 50, 100 milligrams. 50 to, to 70. And some of these we're getting into maybe at 30, 20 to 30 milligrams, but not active enough. You have to get up to a certain degree of shrubbery on the nitrogen to get more activity. And how many of these compounds do you imagine there are that are at simple Casually variants? you can make uh, 30, 40, 50. Uh, why do you suppose it is that this fast-acting, easily manufactured, spectacular hallucinogen is so rarely met in the underground. I don't know. I have heard that there is, it's there in some quantity. I heard about a seizure in Boston, I believe, was of, of ayahuasca. And they seized it on the basis that it contained DMT. Right, that was the Santo Daime oh, yes, people right, from, from right, Brazil. Right. But 
you know, we live in a society where people jump out of airplanes mm -hmm. and hang by bungee cords over mm -hmm. bridges. And DMT, which is always described mm -hmm. as an easy synthesis, mm -hmm. is, is just not not there. It's, it violates <laughs> one of these economic, economic laws. Basic laws. Gresham like or Graham <laughs> or somebody. <laughs> Something that I've always wanted to ask you, which is, unlike me, you seem remarkably resistant to what I call the implication. <laughs> I mean, how how can you just do these things over and over again and not be nutty as a fruitcake? So? <laughs> well, are and you? I, I think are so. you? I think I, I relaxed <laughs> in the event. But unlike me, you don't feel the need to rave about that aspect of it. Not particularly. I'd rather quietly stay half in the closet and continue doing what I'm doing. But you do, you've probably seen more uncharted internal landscape than half of mankind put together. I mean, that would not be an immodest claim. They're a little bit charted now. Well, yeah. a very little bit. Very little, that's right. But the seeds are there to be used by anyone else. That's the reason for the, for the book, just to get it all recorded into a documented form. But... It always puzzles me. I mean, I think Hoffman and Wasson and certainly to some degree Schultes, to some degree you, nobody, wa everybody says, well, I'm just a humble botanist or I'm just a hard-working workbench chemist. Nobody wants to actually say, this must be very, very important. We must, because it's so uniquely beyond ordinary mm -hmm. expectation. Yes, but the importance is going to take a long time to realize. What you can't build without the tools, and you have to have the tools, and these are the tools that allow the building to be done. I'm not a builder. I'm a tool maker. And that's probably one of the reasons I have not described a lot of the landscapes. I don't see them differently. Uh, if we could compare it to uh the invention of the telescope. Probably within 50 years of the invention of the telescope, the major solar system new paradigms were put in place. This seems very elusive. It seems hard for us to go beyond simply saying it exists, it's really far out, and then we sort of fall silent. Do you, what do you think about that? I think the silence is in part imposed upon us by a very unsympathetic authority body. And maybe it's just as well, because that way a lot of work can be done and sort of recorded for posterity. And the time the pendulums swing, they will swing back. And the time will come when this, this work will be, uh, will be used, research will be done with these tools that uh, will be good. Well, obviously you believe in it strongly. What would you say to a critic who said, what, what's so great about this? Are you and your friends in any significant way different from the rest of humanity? No, and I don't see why it would be critical. I'm not offending him. I can see no way in which I'm offending him. I'm quietly doing my little alchemist thing at home. But you really must think that it, it does make a difference. I think it does. I think it will. It will. I don't think it does now. So we really are cursed with being pioneers. Yeah. All it's right. not so bad. <laughs> no. It's not so it, bad. It, it, has, it has a nice... nice I mean, they'll nice hang good. your picture in the main hall years hence and say, these were giants. <laughs> I would rather have my picture hanging in the main hall than me hanging in the <laughs> Well, involved. some people manage both, both. That, that's true. <laughs> and you, you yeah. may end up that way, too. Oh, well, it's a short, happy life. It's, it's kind of neat. Well, but you've... this is your territory, too. What's your feeling? Do you feel that that's, that's a fair... I, I think that I have always, from the very first psychedelic experience, had the uncanny intuition that, yes, this has been around for 50,000 years, mm -hmm but it's somehow going to be critically important in our lifetime 
that we will need it for something. Maybe just to think our way mm -hmm. out of the mess that we're getting into. We well, okay. But you, if it's needed, we have it. Yes. That's, that's the beauty. The, the tool is there for the time when the need is obvious. And this may be, it may be our lifetime. So essentially what you're doing is you're placing tools on the shelf. Mm -hmm. Screwdrivers mm -hmm. for screws that haven't it been haven't invented been made exactly yet. That. Except it's a good tool. Its use will depend upon someone who has that particular view of, of me. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing. Where do you hope to be in 10 years or so with all of this? If you Probably ever... starting on a third book. <laughs> do you think, I know you're working on a book about legalization uh, and... Not actually, I'm working with a group uh, who is more or less uh, funded to make arguments that would be raised, to address arguments to be raised in the legalization process. What would be the answer of how drugs would be legalized? How would they be made available? Should it be an open supermarket? Or should it be under some sort of governmental control? And it's a research, uh, more than that, a policy group studies setting up for that. I think it's futile in the, in the present state. In terms of practical impact. I don't think anyone's going to seriously entertain legalization. So it's a, it's a, it's, it may be a fuel process, but it's a fun process. Because in the process you begin evaluating your own relationship to drug law, drug regulation, drug control. If you were in charge of it, how do you see it happening? I mean, are there drugs you would keep legal, or do you think it should be... What I would do if I were running, I would keep certain laws that protect people of innocence. I would have absolutely no drug with children who are of, of too young an age. God knows what they so are. So maybe 16, 18, 21. Maybe the alcohol model. Right. Uh, absolutely unallowed giving drugs to anyone without their consent. Not sure. Uh, uh, informed consent, knowledge, education. I would make absolutely available at all levels about uh, propaganda, restriction, information that is factual about drugs. Then I'd open the drugstore. And do people, would they overuse? Maybe. But I think that would very quickly dampen itself out to maybe about what we have now. But you have removed the criminality, removed the violence, removed the entire uh, social disruptiveness that these drug laws have caused. Would you encourage the government to see uh, these drugs as a vehicle for gaining tax revenue, or do you think the government should stay off that? Probably, uh, hmm. Probably some tax revenue would be valid, as with other drugs of abuse, other things of abuse. Similarly to Similarly, al alcohol and tobacco. It's a good model, and perhaps it's a valid one. Well, that's pretty much what I suggested in my book, but I agree with you that I, it's easy to sit down and come up with a fine plan, mm -hmm. overcoming the political hurdles of an too American... Many people have too much to benefit on the laws being what they are, and even becoming more intense. And uh, you, until, until you change that motivation, that, that reward. Yes, well, the most cynical and the most naive people in America are keeping the drug problem going. The most cynical by dealing and importing drugs, and the most naive through the kind of Christian terror of... Look, look uh, at the monstrous industries that have been built up with it. The drug urine screening. Shameful. Right. But they're multi-billion dollar things. This kit, that GCMS, this instrumentation, these people who make little wax urine bottles. It, it's, it's becoming, there's no justification for urine screening at any time of anyone under any circumstance on a random basis. Well, and, and the notion that in a democratic society people would get into that kind of thing is incredible, I think. It, it's completely contrary to the principles of that society. The assumption of innocence. We blew it because it's not in the Constitution. Right. It should have been in it, but it wasn't. Right. But taking a urine sample on a random basis is an assumption of guilt. Well, and, but what is in the Bill of Rights is life, liberty, and the pursuit God. of happiness. Declaration of independence. Declaration of independence. But that could be used as a sufficient be basis it's, it's a for... It's self-image, and we should maintain it as such. Yeah, well, the first we thing that do. goes when society uh, hits the wall is democracy.